Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing embryonic and induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay, right, so in the previous video what we saw is that what confers the specialization of a cell is this combination of master transcription regulators that it has. Okay, so each different specialized cell type has a combination of master transcription regulators that keeps it as that cell type, basically, okay, and controls the entire expression of its entire genome. Okay, so it, con it, it controls all of epigenetics, basically, and therefore controls the transcriptome and the proteome of that cell, and hence the phenotype of that cell, and what sort of cell type it actually is. Okay, so, Basically, we saw that the way this happens is that you have this combination of master transcription regulators, okay, which is self-perpetuating, i.e. it maintains its own expression, and then through the alteration of the expression levels of downstream transcription regulators, uh, it can then influence uh, a much wider jurisdiction of genes, basically, and eventually it can control the entire genome, basically, and uh, control, hence, the transcriptome and the proteome and uh, the phenotype of the cell. We then uh, wanted to look at what the master transcription regulators were for uh, the pluripotent state. So, for instance, in embryonic stem cells, which remember are these cells derived from inner cell mass cells. Okay, and we discussed how there were three master transcription regulators in uh, embryonic stem cells, and these were. KLF4, OCT4, and SOX2, okay, so those were the master ones, okay, and we discussed how there is this network that maintains the expression of those uh, free master uh, transcription regulators. Okay, then we talked about a few downstream transcription regulators of those master ones. So we talked about CMIC being downstream of activation by KLF4, and how CMIC is extremely important in keeping the cell proliferating. Okay, we also talked about this extremely important transcription factor, NANOG, okay, which is, has its expression activated by all three of the master transcription regulators, and NANOG is involved in uh, controlling the expression of many genes uh, that then confers the phenotypic features of an embryonic stem cell. Okay, so for instance, its shape and other things about it, okay? And also, NANOG is extremely important in uh, stopping the expression of other master transcription regulators which are involved in differentiated states, okay? So, for instance, MyOD was an example of a master transcription regulator which we saw was associated with skeletal muscle cells, okay? That one would be inhibited, have its expression repressed uh, by NANOG to keep the cell in the pluripotent state. Okay, so now we're in a position to talk about induced pluripotent stem cells. So, firstly, just a few abbreviations. ESCs, whenever you hear someone referring to ESCs, that means embryonic stem cells. Okay, IPSCs, that means induced pluripotent stem cells, and the I is always lowercase compared to the PSCs, which is uppercase. So, induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay, right, so what is an induced pluripotent stem cell? Well, basically the idea is, can we take a somatic, fully differentiated cell and convert it back into a pluripotent stem cell? Okay, and this is the idea behind induced pluripotent stem cells. Well, how do you think you could do this? Well, look at what I've told you about these master transcription regulators of the pluripotent state, okay? If we were to artificially force a, um, a somatic differentiated cell of the body to express these four, uh, sorry, these three uh, master transcription regulators, uh, KLF4, uh, OCT4, and SOX2, okay, and we can force them to express them by, for instance, retrovirally infecting them with an additional copy of the gene, basically, so that they make more of it, okay, uh, then would that return us to an embryonic stem cell-like state? Well, yes, it would, because look at the downstream regulator, NANOG here, 
Okay, Nanog would repress the expression of all the other master transcription regulators which were involved in giving the cell its differentiated state. Okay, it would also increase the expression of the genes which give the cell a phenotype similar to the embryonic stem cells. Okay, and in addition, KLF4 induces this downstream uh, transcription regulator CMIC, which will give the cells the proliferation property. Okay, so this is the basic idea behind induced pluripotent stem cells. You take a somatic cell, okay, so for instance, you could take a fibroblast from the skin. Everyone always works with fibroblasts because they're easy to uh, take a biopsy of. Okay, uh, so you can take a fibroblast from the skin, okay, what you can do is you can force it to artificially express very high levels of KLF4, OCT4, and SOX2. Okay, so what we're going to do is get it to express KLF4, OCT4, and SOX2 at high levels. And as I say, a way of doing that is infecting it with a retrovirus that will add additional genes for these free factors in, okay, and therefore uh, force the expression of those up. Okay, and this basically gets the cell to completely change. Okay, and what happens to the cell? Well, actually, it goes back to looking just like an embryonic stem cell. Okay, and we call these sort of cells that we've got from somatic cells, which are extremely like embryonic stem cells, we call them induced pluripotent stem cells, IPSCs. Okay, and they proliferate fantastically. You can keep them in culture, you can proliferate them indefinitely. Okay, so what you can do is you can get your cell here, you can put it on a petri dish in a lovely growth medium, you can let it divide and divide and divide, it will produce a whole population of induced pluripotent stem cells which will all be the same. Okay, you can propagate this on and on, you can give collections of it to your friends and they can all propagate it on so they're fantastic basically and you don't what's lovely about this is you can do this from a somatic cell of an adult human okay so we get around the ethical issues of having to take embryo embryonic stem cells from embryos okay which a lot of people object to okay so um in, that's what an induced pluripotent stem cell is. So they proliferate, which is the, one of the key properties of uh, embryonic stem cells. So that's one of the properties that they share with embryonic stem cells. The other key thing is that they are also pluripotent. Okay, and remember what does pluripotent mean? Well, remember what did it mean in the context of embryonic stem cells? It meant that we could re-inject the embryonic stem cell into uh, a blastocyst and it could participate in the development of any portion of the body basically. Okay, and indeed what you can do is the same thing with these induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay, so again you have to go to mice now, you can't do this in humans. Okay, that would be very, very bad. Uh, so what you can do is you can go to mice, you can take a somatic cell from a mouse, maybe a fibroblast, you can convert it into an induced pluripotent stem cell, it's the same factors in mice as in humans. Okay, and then what you can do is you can take a mouse blastocyst. Okay, so I'll put a mouse blastocyst here, which is totally separate from the mouse that we got the uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from. Okay, so here's the mouse blastocyst, these are the trophoblasts here, here's the inner cell mast cells. Okay, and what we can do is add some of these induced pluripotent stem cells into the inner cell mass. So I'll colour in the original inner cell mass cells in red here. Okay, and then these induced pluripotent stem cells that we're going to add into the inner cell mass will have these in orange. Okay, so here in orange, these are induced pluripotent stem cells that we have now added, uh, which are totally different genomes to uh, the genomes of the uh, inner cell mast cells that we have here. So these are induced pluripotent stem cells. And again, what you will get is a chimeric mouse. Okay, so I'll try and draw the mouse a little bit better this time. Okay, so here's our mouse. Still looks a little bit more like a rabbit. Okay, so here is uh, our mouse. And again, it's a chimeric mouse, okay? Bits of it will be made from the induced pluripotent stem cells. And again, you can find um, induced pluripotent stem cells that have given rise to 
all different cell types of the body. Okay, so that's what I mean by these cells really are pluripotent. If you stick them into a blastocyst, they can contribute to any portion of the mouse's body, basically. They are pluripotent. Okay, so they are a true miracle, basically. How on earth, um, you know, you wouldn't have thought that that was doable, but that is doable. Okay, they are incredible. Right, okay, the other thing we are now beginning to be able to do with induced pluripotent stem cells is we're beginning to understand how to make them differentiate into certain cell types in vitro. Okay, so I've just shown you that if you put them in vivo, then nature can force them to differentiate into different cell types, um, any different cell type of the body. Okay, but what we'd be like to be able to do is take these induced pluripotent stem cells in a test tube in vitro, expose them to certain factors and make them differentiate into new types of cells. And indeed, we are beginning to understand how to do that. Okay, and when I say understand how to do that, what I mean is we are beginning to find out ways of doing that. Okay, the way that you work out how to uh, turn an induced pluripotent stem cell into a certain type of differentiated cell is just trial and error at the moment. You chuck all sorts of things at it and see what happens. Okay, but we have found some interesting things out. So, for instance, if you want to turn an induced pluripotent stem cell into a macrophage, so you want to make your induced pluripotent stem cell differentiate into a macrophage, there are three factors that you need to expose your induced pluripotent stem cell to. One is macrophage colony stimulating factor, MCSF. Okay, the other is interleukin 1, okay, and also interleukin 3. So if you expose your induced pluripotent stem cell to macrophage colony stimulating factor interleukin 1 and interleukin 3, then the induced pluripotent stem cell will differentiate into a macrophage. Okay, so these uh, exogenously applied factors must somehow be able to change the uh, master transcription regulators that are expressed within the cell and their by switch the differentiation state of the cell from this induced pluripotent stem cell state into uh, the uh, differentiated state of a macrophage. Okay, and there's numerous other examples. We can make them differentiate into all sorts of things now. Okay, and it's growing all the time what we can turn them into. Right, okay, so that's induced pluripotent stem cells now covered. Okay, what I now want to talk about is some uses of uh, embryonic stem cell technology and induced pluripotent stem cell technology and also uh, trans differentiation. Now, some of these are in their very early stages and potentially may well become clinically useful later on, while some of them are absolutely essential for uh, research. Okay, right. So the first one that I'm going to tell you about is absolutely essential for scientific research, and this is how to make a genetically knocked out mouse. Okay, so how to make a knockout mouse, basically, where you have knocked out certain genes. Okay, so uh, basically the idea here is that we're going to use embryonic stem cells. Okay, so what you do is you take your embryonic stem cells that you have harvested from some uh, inner cell mass, okay? Uh, so here are the embryonic stem cells. And what you can do is you can knock out genes from the embryonic stem cells, and we're not going to talk about the mechanism by which you actually uh, knock uh, genes out of individual cells. Okay, that's another whole topic in itself. We want to talk about once you can knock genes out of cells, how can you knock genes out of an entire mouse, basically? Okay, so what you do is you take your embryonic stem cells and uh, you can knock genes out of the embryonic stem cells. Okay, so you now do your genetic engineering on the embryonic stem cells to create embryonic stem cells that are now lacking certain genes. Okay, so you knock out the gene, which I'll just abbreviate down to KO. Okay, so you knock out the gene, and then what you're going to do is you're going to uh, now take these genetically modified embryonic stem cells and you're going to put them into the blastocyst of another uh, embryo, okay, for a mouse. Okay, so again, we're going to make one of these chimeric mice in, in the first instance. Okay, 
In fact, we'll want to make more than one Chimera, okay, but we'll come on to that in a moment. So, here is our Blast Assist, these are our Trophoblasts. Blasts, okay, and again what we will do is add into the inner cell mass uh, some of these genetically modified embryonic stem cells. So again, I'll colour in uh, the initial inner cell mass cells of this uh, embryo in red, and now what we're going to do is add in some of these genetically modified embryonic stem cells here in blue. Okay, so we'll put some of these in here. Okay, now what we will do is we'll put this blastocyst into a mother mouse and it will uh, develop into a chimeric mouse. Okay, so what we've now got is our chimeric mouse, okay, uh, which has got certain portions of its body made by these genetically modified embryonic stem cells. Okay, now uh, the idea here is that what you need is you need to make lots of these chimeric mice, okay, and you need a male mouse and a girl uh, mouse um, that are both chimeras, and what you need is for these mice to have had some of their germ cells produced by the genetically modified embryonic stem cells. Okay, so what do I mean by a germ cell? The germ cells are the cells which make the gametes of the mouse, okay? So they're the cells which either in a female will make the egg cells, or in the male will make the sperm cells. Okay, now some of the germ cells were derived from uh, these genetically uh, modified um, embryonic stem cells here, then those germ cells will not have any of the, any genes for the gene, well, any copies of the gene that we knocked out, basically, from those embryonic stem cells. Okay, right, so the idea is that what you need to do is you need to get a male chimera and a female chimera, such that the male chimera has sperm, which don't have any copies of the gene in, because they are coming from germ cells, which were derived from the uh, knocked out uh, embryonic stem cells. And then you need a female mouse, uh, where the egg cells do not have any copies of the gene, because they were derived from germ cells, which were derived from these uh, genetically modified embryonic stem cells. Okay, then what you're going to do is you're going to fertilize the egg cell that has no copies of the gene with the sperm cell that has no copies of the gene, and then finally you have a zygote which has no copies of the gene, basically, because the sperm and the egg cells uh, which you used to make it had no copies of the gene. And then what you can do is just put this inside uh, a uh, mother mouse and um, it will develop into a mouse that has no copies of the gene in any of its somatic cells. And then what you've got is your knockout mouse. And knockout mice are used to investigate the functions of a huge number of proteins. Basically what you do is you knock out the gene for a protein and then you see what goes wrong basically and that gives you a clue as to uh, where the protein is important and then you can investigate further what has happened in these knockout mice. Okay, right, so that's uh, one use for um, embryonic stem cells. In the next video, what I will do is I'll continue this discussion of uses for embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells and trans differentiation. And we'll talk about cell therapy, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about the potential for this to be used to treat things like type 1 diabetes mellitus. We'll also talk about how trans differentiation might have a role in treating uh, non fatal myocardial infarction. And then we'll talk about how this can be used in disease modeling and drug uh, testing uh, for rare genetic conditions such as Timothy syndrome.